As the war in Vietnam raged, college campuses across the country were on the front lines of dissent. Well, the campus atmosphere was beginning to have the sense of revolution. Police clashed with student protesters. Police officers in gas masks, a sense of panic. On the heels of the Kent State shootings, President Nixon visits the University of Tennessee. We wanted to make sure that he wasn't given a total warm welcome. Now, a sense of revolution on East Tennessee PBS. War is the most destructive activity of the human being. It all kind of came together for me, and I just suddenly realized that this whole thing's a sham. The veil came off for me. The reality of the Vietnam War at that time, it was just difficult to comprehend that this would go on and that we were so uninformed for a long time about it. It's actually invigorating to have that many people of, of like mind and feeling that you're in you know, the same movement coming together and feeling the power, I guess, of that what we could do to possibly change and you know, bring about an end to the war. It was the first time that I felt the University of Tennessee was united in the struggle against this war. In East Tennessee, the 1960s were a time of significant social transformation. The Civil Rights Movement had brought about historic changes, including the desegregation of colleges. But in the mid-60s, black students at the University of Tennessee were still few in number. I was one of the first black undergraduates to go to the University of Tennessee. And um, there was still a lot of racial prejudice going on. I get frustrated when people call it integration. It really wasn't. It was just sticking a few black people here and there. They had to deal with the hostility of students, the hostility of townsfolk, professors. Well, there were no black teachers on campus. So we decided we wanted to form a black student union. And one of the things that we lobbied for was having black faculty on the University of Tennessee. But the Civil Rights Movement would give rise to widespread changes in social attitudes. College campuses that had been forced to adjust to new ideas about race now faced another issue, women's liberation. Female students at the University of Tennessee began protesting their 10 o'clock curfew and demanded their rights as adults. Up in Johnson City at the girls' dormitory, people, they had to be in at eight o'clock at night. That was a rule. And down here at the University of Tennessee, it was a little bit more generous. They had to be in at 10 o'clock at night. Female students protested the curfew through civil disobedience. Everybody tended to call me the chaplain to Episcopal students and that the campus was my responsibility. Well, the women formed a revolution one night and decided they would stay out later on. So we hosted them at uh, Tyson House, the Episcopal Center, and we must have had 300 girls in there that were not going to go into the dormitories. So that was one of the episodes of campus which indicated that things were you know, about to be in significant change, and they certainly were. The curfew victory emboldened students and proved they could be agents of social change. A growing youth movement was sweeping the nation, propelling young people and their counterculture into the spotlight. One of the things that's most characteristic of America in the 1960s was the enormous presence of young people. After all, after World War II, you had the baby boom, and you had returning servicemen having relatively large families. This was a very affluent generation. It was a generation going to college in numbers unprecedented because of the expansion of higher education. And the youth movement of this time also stimulated a type of counterculture, uh, groups that didn't accept American society, uh, didn't accept the values of capitalism, believed in different values and uh, the use of drugs. 
sexual relationships. In the background of all this was the hippie movement where it was a countercultural movement where it was okay to have long hair, you weren't judged on your appearance, and the whole civil rights movement was interwoven in all this. We're creating a new culture. Sounds uh, strange to say that, but that's really what was happening. And, and there was a lot of optimism. At college campuses in East Tennessee, the youth movement began setting its sights on the war in Vietnam. One of the most controversial issues of that time was the draft. One of the things about the Vietnam War was the decision by Washington to rely for the draft on its manpower rather than calling up the reserves. Military service in the United States was not universal. It was called selective service. The idea was that you would serve, but you could also be deferred if you were doing other things that were seen as socially valuable. Well, one of the things that possessed a deferment during this time was college. And college students could, could go to college and even graduate school and defer their service. For male college students under the age of 27, the draft cast a shadow over their academic pursuits. But for African-American students, this threat was magnified. I was drafted five times. My, my lottery number was 35. From 18 to 27, I had that war hanging over my head. Knoxville College is what's known as an HBCU, historically black college. I remember this one young man, and we all had to take a foreign language, so he ended up taking French. And at the time, I was a French major, and I remember him saying, you gotta help me, or they're gonna end up sending me to Vietnam. And I did everything and anything I could to help him pass that class. My advisor, when I first walked into his office, he said, well, you know, your kind never does really well in college. You're probably not going to make it through college. And then he proceeded to have me take, this was a quarter system, 21 hours, my first quarter freshman year. It was a rough time. It was a rough time. The draft, in effect, created a sense of inequality about the war. So there was this perception that the draft uh, fell unequally on uh, Americans, particularly uh, those of less income, uh, non-whites, and others. Campus activists in East Tennessee began to speak out against what they saw as the injustice of the draft. One of my friends was being drafted and he had curvature of the spine, and it was against the law for him to be drafted. And the situation so infuriated me that um, I talked to a couple of uh, lawyers, a gentleman from the law school at that point, who voluntarily established what we call the Knoxville Draft Counseling Service, helping people understand what their rights were before the draft law. And I suppose we helped well over a thousand people face their draft situation. Many student activists also felt the war in Vietnam was morally wrong and began working to bring about its end. By October 1969, student government leaders organized a one-day campus-wide strike. Protests against the war began drawing thousands of students to the cause. We started organizing just a number of events here in Knoxville to protest the war. There were no uh, blueprints, you know. I was helpful in that I knew how to make a silk screen, <laughs> so we would make posters and put them up all over. There were some posters against the war. As part of that, Joanne and I still screened the cover for the leaflets. We would hand those out at different events, and they were radical at the time. There's no question about it. Stephen and some of his friends were putting on festivals at Circle Park that were free, and that would just be a place for people to gather. We would have protests in Circle Park at UT at times, so, you know, a band I was playing in would play for that, those particular events. But not everyone in East Tennessee opposed the war in Vietnam. Even on the UT campus, many students felt it was their patriotic duty to support the war effort. 
Tell me, Dave, do you expect to be drafted one day? Yes, I'm sure I will. Are you going to try to fight it, or do you feel that it's your place to answer the draft call? I have no intention of fighting it. All right, then uh, what about the other people on campus? Do you feel that the University of Tennessee students generally support the uh, government's policy in Vietnam? I believe that a majority of them do. I'm sure there are some that don't, but I think a majority do support the policy. During the 1969 moratorium, members of the student group Young Americans for Freedom held their own rally, burning the Viet Cong flag. Uh, there were certain people that tended to, uh, in, in the protest movements that were, you know, anti-protesters, you know, they would, you know, yell at us and, and call us, you know, commies for, you know, trying to stop something the government was doing. For many East Tennesseans, fear of communism was a real concern during the Cold War and the war in Vietnam was seen as a necessary part of stopping the expansion of communism. The fear of communism cuts to the core of what many Americans believe is central to our own ideology, namely free enterprise, freedom of religion. Um, communist states were seen as antithetical to what our traditional American liberties of commerce, of, of worship, uh, of uh, free association. And communist states were seen as hostile to that. The pro-war people, I think, were staunch Americans who thought that uh, whatever the government really decided had to be the right thing. I don't think they understood the Vietnam War uh, very well. Some American soldiers saw the protests against the Vietnam War as unpatriotic and hostile towards the GIs themselves. It seems ironic that while our finest young men are fighting halfway across the world, other young men and women, safe at home, openly advocate abandonment of Vietnam to communism. Perhaps they really don't know what this war is all about. Well, I think protesters don't really know what they're talking about. They don't know what's going on. You know, you got to be over there before you know what's happening. I was so angry. You're standing there protesting me while you're on your com comfy little campus instead of having your ass over here next to me. How dare you? You know, people wanted to say that we were against the soldiers. We were never against the soldiers. We were against the people putting those people in uniform and taking their young lives away. Some Vietnam veterans returned to East Tennessee with a new purpose, bringing an end to the war. In organizations such as Vietnam Veterans Against the War, those protests help those veterans find their voices in protesting against the war, and they became an enormously legitimate, active, and well-regarded set of voices against the war because they were speaking from their own experience. On January 15, 1970, a student protest unrelated to the Vietnam War would bring violence to the University of Tennessee. A popular university president had retired over the winter break. The new president was considered a political hire by many students. Outrage swept the campus. We had a uh, major protest over the appointment of Ed Bowling as the president of the university. Students didn't like the political nature of Ed Bowling. They were in love with Andy Holt, who was like your grandfather. Peter Kamey, that was a uh, South American student at the campus, was also, um, you know, bringing on some uh, guerrilla theater, as you would call it, about, you know, challenging the, the uh, president of the university to a duel, which, in my opinion, was going to be an arm wrestle, something that was just basically a theater more so than actually, a, you know, any type of violent event. And I was coming out of class, and there was a small group of about 20 people on the hill with a megaphone, Peter Kamey being one of the people in it, kind of cheering and chanting about it, really kind of a non-event. But university administrators saw the student protesters as a threat. There was a group of police officers in gas masks blocking the entrance to the administration building, but I was allowed through, and it was interesting to see what transpired within the administration, it was almost like a sense of panic. One administrator called every one of the students communists and said they should be thrown in jail. As classes in nearby buildings began letting out, 
Thousands of curious students began gathering around the administration building to see what was happening. And it seemed like I turned around and the next thing I knew there were 2,000, 3,000 students there. All of a sudden the front doors of the administration building open up and uh, Knoxville police uh, come flooding out of the front of the building, which we didn't even know they were in there, probably close to 100 police officers in riot gear with shotguns, dogs, and uh, shields, and basically went into an attack mode and started hitting people with clubs and chasing people down. And the police were coming down the hill, sweeping the hill with shields and batons. At that point, uh, I was being chased and probably 20 feet away from being nabbed and, and possibly hit, and somebody had packed a uh, snowball with <laughs> ice pretty strong and hit the police officer with a snowball and got his attention away from me and probably kept me from being arrested. A good friend of mine named Ray Alexander walking over to the campus looking for me, and all of a sudden there's this phalanx of cops surrounding me. And I turned around and I looked, and there was this young black man in, the, in some bushes in front of the administration building, crouched down, and he looked up, and he gave me a peace sign. And I just grabbed my camera up, no time to focus or set exposure, and fired a shot. And that actually became a very iconic image of the era. I was looked at as being the only person that could go between the two sides. And so I would take messages back and forth. And one of the messages was, get the police and the dogs off the campus. They did. They cooperated in that way, and gradually things kind of settled down. But there was a, a bad moment there. But it was hard to believe this was really happening in Knoxville. There were thousands of students. There were, I couldn't even estimate how many police. Gas masks, batons, shields. 22 students were arrested including the South American agitator, Peter Kamey. The mood on campus became more aggressive at that point. Three months after what would become known as the riot on the hill, President Nixon orders a full-scale invasion of Cambodia, a neutral country bordering Vietnam. This expansion of the war sparks protests across the country. When President Nixon bombed Cambodia in the spring of 1970, a group of us decided that we should strike to demonstrate that we were really upset about that, that part of the Vietnam War. So we actually blocked the entrances to Knoxville College and would not allow the professors to come on. We stayed out of class. But on May 4, 1970, a student protest against the Cambodian campaign leads to tragedy at Kent State University, Ohio National Guardsmen began firing into the crowd, killing four students. The incident shocks the nation, bringing a new wave of tension to college campuses everywhere. Over 3,000 University of Tennessee students gather in peaceful protests. After Kent State, it brought a reality to everything. People realized that it happened there, it could happen here and it brought a seriousness that it was almost surreal. It was the first time that I felt the University of Tennessee was united in the struggle against this war. The whole school went on strike. The universities around the country shut down and we brought pretty much, you know, the educational system to a hold at that point saying that, you know, things have to be discussed and things have to change. Less than two weeks after the shooting at Kent State, Police in Mississippi fire hundreds of rounds into a crowd of Jackson State College students. One Jackson State student and a high school senior are killed. The killings of young people during protests shock the conscience of Americans everywhere. The atmosphere on America's college campuses was one of anger and fear support for the Vietnam War was decreasing. When people saw what happened on that campus, that turned a lot of the country against that war. More and more people were very critical of the war over time, including those who had supported it previously. More criticism was offered by protesters, more criticism was offered by media, more criticism was offered by people in government. 
Amidst the tensions caused by the invasion of Cambodia and the student killings came an announcement. President Nixon would visit the University of Tennessee. Nixon apparently felt that he should have some sort of a stamp of uh, acceptance on a university campus and decided that he would come to the Billy Graham crusade. The Graham-Nixon uh, protest, May 70, uh, came three weeks after um, the Kent State killings. Everybody was riled up. This was his first visit to a college campus after Kent State, and uh, most campuses didn't want him, and we wanted to make sure that he wasn't given a total warm welcome for what, what he had done. Student organizers planned a peaceful protest both inside and outside the stadium creating signs and staging small acts of street theater. The street theater had become an integral part of the whole protest movement. Someone showed up uh, just before the uh, protest with a robe that would look biblical and said, why don't you wear that? So I said, why don't I? <laughs> so I did. And so I went out to the protest wearing this robe and everybody had little signs. They'd made up signs as thou shall not kill. The football stadium was, uh, the estimates were about 75,000 people that were there that came in from as far away as Chattanooga. And, you know, we settled up into the stands as a group and made ourselves known that, you know, through showing our peace, you know, signs and, and things, and we didn't stand up when Nixon came on stage. And I know the people around us, some people got kicked in the back for not standing up, and there was a lot of aggression, you know, going on at that point. Nixon was on the stage, and he received a lot of boos, as well as a lot of cheers. There was a large group of protesters at one corner of the stadium on the east side. They were raucous, as most college students were at that point, with the uh, uh, hippies in full uh, regalia and whatnot. I remember when Nixon got up, uh, just sort of like, just wanting to stare him down. So it was, it was kind of a silent experience for me. When the Nixon part was over, uh, then everything settled down. And then Graham started his delivery, and, and I decided to go down onto the field and listen to it there. When it was over, a policeman came and got me. He said, you're under arrest. The police started taking photographs of everybody, you know, so there would be a record of who was there. And you know, the next day, they started doing arrest. Nine people would be arrested at the event, and another 40 over the following days. Charges ranged from yelling obscenities to disrupting a religious service. Eventually, the you know, federal courts decided that you know that couldn't hold. It wasn't. It couldn't be you know, described as a religious service when Richard Nixon was talking politics. For many at the University of Tennessee, the event marked a turning point in political activism on campus. After Richard Nixon left and Billy Graham left, it seemed like things calmed down a bit. Um, that seemed to end an era, almost. There was still political activity, but it was much quieter. On January 23rd, 1973, President Nixon announced the Paris Peace Accords, which would bring an end to America's involvement in the Vietnam War. Yet, the protests reveal much about how Americans viewed the war and their government, and it held those in power accountable for their actions. The cumulative pressure of citizen protest against the war wore down on decision makers. I think the historical record would show that protest against the war did push uh, and create uh, pressure to ending the American involvement in the war. I think that there's no way of understanding that war without recognizing that protests helped bring it to an end. The anti-war protests had a great deal to do with uh, President Johnson deciding not to run for a second term. The Nixon campaign ran on uh, the expectation or the promise that they would end the war. So I think the protests and the whole change um, of attitudes among many American citizens has had an enduring political impact on the, the political makeup of the United States. The protests provided a, an alternative look at what's really going on here. 
marches all around the country. The revolutionary movement here in Knoxville where more and more people were becoming involved in the anti-war movement it just built up a lot of pressure and energy. The mood of the country changed. I think the protesters knew what was gonna happen and that's why they protested. I was angry at the time, but then looking back, I'm thinking they knew we were fodder. They knew we were being used. That war, it took away all of our childhood. That war took 50,000, 50,000 children took them away. We should never do that to our young people, never.